Now we will uh, welcome the next uh, presenter, which is uh, Rod Muir from the Sierra Group in uh, Canada. And uh, he will talk about the connection between waste diversion and the mitigation at, uh, of claim climate change. So uh, welcome to Rod Muir. We'll just test uh, voice level. Are you okay? So it's at uh, least as mentioned. Uh, what I've been asked to do today is to build on uh, some of the remarks uh, that Mark made this morning, and take you on a, I, I hope, what is a, a journey towards uh, climate change mitigation and sustainability. So as again, I'd like to start with a quote, one that many of you may be familiar: "A journey of a thousand miles begins with a blank slide." I got a funny feeling. Let me click on the wrong button here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Right. Roger, it's all my fault. It turns out. <laughs> begins with a single step. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I heard this quote when I first got into this particular line of work, and it really resonated with me, because what it says is any task, no matter how easy or hard, simple or complex, all starts in exactly the same fashion, with one single step. I just want to mention something that, uh, as well, uh, I've added a few slides as the, pres the day's gone on. Uh, you'll excuse me if, uh, if these take me a bit by surprise. But as Mark said, the goal here, we want to uh, avoid the unmanageable and, and manage the unavoidable. I'm the Waste Diversion Campaigner for the Sierra Club of Canada. My name is Rod Muir. For today's purposes, you can think of me as the low-budget Al Gore. I research, advocate, and educate on the issue of uh, climate uh, waste diversion and sustainability and the mitigation of climate change. Uh, research uh, sessions like this give me a great opportunity to learn uh, more about uh, different aspects of diversion. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, advocate, us, uh, uh, advocate, I spend a lot of time in front of uh, municipal and state and provincial legislators uh, advocating for waste diversion, and then a great deal of time as well educating uh, uh, individuals, uh, groups such as yourself, uh, what have you. Uh, just a note on the presentation, a bit unique uh, in terms of the layout, the slides, and the, the terminology move from the bottom up to the top, onward and upward, as I like to think, onward and upward. I, too, want to convey my thanks to Lisa uh, for inviting me, for uh, uh, Tamis for helping me get down here, uh, for Mateus uh, for uh, 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 recommending me for the uh, the opportunity, uh, Rochelle for and both Rochelle and Matisse for helping me with the preparation of some of the material uh, today, and and like everyone else, my thanks, my heartfelt thanks to you, and, and the work that you all do every day uh, to help me uh, and and the rest of us achieve sustainability. Uh, it just incalculable effort, incalculable benefit. Thank you so much. I want to talk to you today. In, in a number of different roles as significant industry players in the diversion industry, as business owners. Uh, I want to talk to you about as a, opinion makers. My goal here is, is to get you out into the field. I'm going to turn you all into apostles. And if even better, rabbis, ministers, uh, imams, whatever your religion has, happens to be. I, I want you to take a, what I hope is a, a fairly simple, concise message of, of the importance of waste diversion out into the field, talk, talk to residents, talk to politicians, talk to staff, talk to whoever. Uh, there, there's much that can be done here, and, and you'll, you'll see the benefits in just a few moments. Uh, also, ultimately, as residents and homeowners, I'm sure many, all of you live in a home somewhere, uh, all of you generate waste in your everyday activity, and, and there's much on an individual basis that can be done. I don't necessarily agree with Mark, what Mark has said in, in terms of individual uh, 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 effort. It, it's about all of us. The, uh, the, you know, the fish and the monkeys and the rest of the flora and fauna, they're not the ones producing all this trash. It's us. It's you and me. The six or seven million of us that are, that are on Earth currently, and, and it's us collectively uh, that, that need to, in particular, start to divert this waste in, in an effort to mitigate climate change. And again, you'll see the connection in just a few moments. Um, 
I picked up a great phrase when I was uh, in business school, start with the end in mind. And in uh, this particular instance, many of you may be thinking that, it, that in fact there's very little connection uh, between uh, waste aversion and climate change uh, when the reality of it is, I was doing so well. There is a big connection, and this is the, this is the easy one. You know, I say to my environmental friends get, who are trying to get people out of their cars, good luck. Uh, to my environmental friends trying to uh, uh, encourage energy efficiency at home, I think the, uh, the solution's simple. We just simply have to make the price of power more reflective of, of what it costs the environment. But uh, waste diversion's a, a whole other category or a whole other ish. I'm not sure how to describe it. it it's just a, something else entirely. Uh, there, and again, it, in this particular case, it does boil down in the end to individual responsibility. And again, that's something else I'll expand on it as, uh, as the presentation progresses. In fact, I'd argue that in, when it comes to achieving sustainability, and, and I'm going to use a bit broader, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to use climate change and, and global warming somewhat interchangeably. Mark's right. It begins with global warming. It's global warming that causes climate change. It's also uh, uh, causing other issues as well, the uh, uh, lack of uh, the uh, uh, extinction of species, the acidification of the oceans, and as a result, the depletion of coral reefs. There, there's a lot of things that fall out of the fact that we're warming the globe. Uh, again, one of them being uh, climate. But at times, I'm going to step back from that and talk as well about a bigger sustainability issue. There's no question the, the climate crisis is at the center of it. But we're, we're running out of a, a lot of uh, 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 minerals, uh, uh, rocks and minerals uh, and metals that, that are required for our everyday lives. We need to be uh, conserving these. Uh, the way we farm, uh, as uh, Will talked about uh, uh, quite a bit, the way we're farming is not doing the, uh, is not doing the world any uh, great favors either. Uh, so there's uh, much work to be done uh, here as well. But the, the, the point I want to make when it comes to achieving sustainability, waste aversion, I'll argue, and I'll argue quite emphatically, is, is amongst, if not the cheapest, quickest, and yes, easiest way uh, that we can start to uh, achieve sustainability and start to turn the corner on, on, uh, on global warming and start to overcome some of these uh, climate change issues that we're facing. The frequent storms, the heat waves, uh, what have you. I've just been reading some material, and it may not relate very well to you guys who live in Atlanta. I know you've got it pretty hot down here. But for instance, the city of Toronto has just finished commissioning a climate change study, and the number of days when the temperature will be above 30 in Toronto uh, is now averages about 90 a year. 30 years from now, it's going to average 40 a year. Uh, and as you know, Mark's pointed out, uh, a lot of, perhaps not a whole lot of us, uh, will be around for that, but a lot of our kids will be, a lot of our nieces and nephews will be, a lot of our grandchildren will be. And, and these are the folks we need to be thinking about. So again, quicker, I'll argue, waste aversion, quicker, cheaper, and easier than some of the other alternatives that we're looking at. And again, I'll, I'll expand on this in just a few moments. Because after all, you know, sustainability is just, a con is just a fancy consultant's word for balance. Something that is, in, is sustainable is in balance. Inputs equal outputs. It's just a fancy word for balance, that's all it is. And it's what we're trying to achieve in this day and age is a, a balance. In, in the one instance, a balance of the amount of carbon we're spewing into the atmosphere as opposed to the amount of carbon that, uh, that, tr that uh, trees and plants uh, can take out of it. So while it didn't start exactly like this, uh, about, uh, I was in the advertising business for about uh, 20 years or so, and I took a good, long, hard look at my life, the restaurant business in particular, and I just thought I don't want to be soup standing at the pearly gates with super size in your fries as my claim to fame. I made a list. The list had on it air, land, air, water, world peace. Then I thought perhaps I could retire. Land to me meant land filling, and, and that's pretty much where I uh, uh, dove in and have uh, stayed in that particular uh, a body of water ever since, as it were. I come at this as, at, 
I'm not your standard environmentalist per se. I don't have a science background. I don't have an environmental science background. In fact, my background is in business. I have an undergraduate degree in hotel and food administration, which over the years provided me great exposure to organics. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of organic material, food scrap material coming out of the restaurant uh, uh, industries, you can imagine. Great exposure to packaging. I was uh, subsequently uh, the uh, director of home delivery. I tried to get out of the marketing side for a while and into the operations side of the business. Uh, as you know, it's good to get multiple exposure. And in this uh, aspect, Will, and I, uh, Will Allen and I have something in common. I, too, worked for KFC in Canada. I was the director of home delivery. I now call it garbage in reverse. Uh, but uh, what it uh, provided for me was great exposure to logistics. Uh, so that when a member of a solid waste uh, staff in the city explains to me how hard it is to collect solid waste, my response is, try 30 minutes or it's free, and, 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 we'll, uh, you know, and then we'll talk about how hard it is to, get, to pick up something nobody wants, that you got all day to get, that doesn't have to be hot or cold, or doesn't have to have a drink with it, or uh, uh, you know, a, side, a side salad of a special type, what have you. Uh, it, it, again, ex great exposure to logistics, great exposure to organics and uh, packaging through the food service business. I like to think of myself as the populist environmentalist, uh, perhaps as well, the, I hesitate to some extent, the realistic environmentalist. Uh, you know, perhaps, not, again, not having come from a, a diehard uh, uh, a view of this, as someone 10 or 15 years ago was probably discarding material uh, to the same degree that all of you maybe or you know, might have been at one point in time. I, you know, I recycled, uh, I, I, I didn't compost per se, I credit my wife Rita for introducing me to that uh, particular aspect, but uh, as you can imagine, uh, my efforts have come a long way in, in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. What I like to uh, say as a claim to fame, I like to keep everybody's feet to the fire. Uh, this, there's a lot more we all can be doing in, as individuals, as, as city staff members, as, as politicians, as uh, staff at uh, the state and federal level. There's just so much more we can be doing about uh, uh, in waste diversion. You know, I, I, I tire of, of the idea that with recycling we've been there and done that. Uh, we, we're, we've been there, but we're sure as hell not doing it very well. Uh, the capture rate of recycling in the U.S. is about 50 percent. Uh, for some materials, it's down around 10 or 15 percent, certain plastics. Uh, paper, we're not too bad, but overall, it's less than 50 percent. It's a system that's in place. It's a system we're paying for. If we could get more material into it, it's a system that would also be a lot less costly to run. That truck comes down your street, stops at your house, whether you've got one pop can in your blue box or 100 pop cans, the cost to collect it is pretty much the same. Uh, so ag again, everybody's feet to fire. It's a tremendous amount of more that we can be doing. So again, I don't come to this necessarily with a standard background. These are some of my uh, touchstones as, uh, throughout my career. Some of these business books you may be familiar with, uh, In Search of Excellence, Good to Great, uh, Every Business is a Growth Business was another book that, that meant a lot to me. A guerrilla marketing, tipping point, uh, you know, all of those. I, I've mentioned rubbish. If you do have an interest in this subject and are interested in a very good book, I, I certainly recommend Rubbish by William Rafji. Uh, I, if you want to pop me an email, you see my email address at the end or come by the table, I can give you a bit more information. This is the fellow from the University of Arizona invented garbage, garbageology. He goes into landfills, digs down, and tells us about our garbage habits. Just a tremendous book, a real fun read. I was fortunate enough to read it within the first couple of months of getting into this and very, very influential for me. And again, I really recommend it. It's, it was available at the Toronto Public Library. It's a fairly easy book to get hold of. And if you'd like more information, I'd be happy to give it to you. I love waste. I mean, if it's not apparent already, man, I, I, do, I have so fallen into it, it's incredible. I love waste. I love the issue. I love the fact it's a common problem with common solutions. Everybody's waste is the same. Only a consultant wants you to believe your waste is unique. That's how they work. Every town's unique. Every town needs its own plan. It's total bullshit. Everybody's waste is the same. Whether it's New York or Omaha or LA, there's as many pop cans, as many banana peels, as many cell phones in the waste. 
it's uniform. The only substantial difference is between apartments and homes, where, of course, in an apartment, you don't have leaf and yard material, whereas in a home, you do. The only discernible difference is between north and south, uh, and that being the, uh, the, uh, the, whether you have a 12-month growing season. If you do, like down here, you've got leaf and yard all year long, where, where you're, if you're from where I am, six months of the year, all I got snow. Uh, so uh, those are the only two differences. Waste is the same. This is a common problem with common solutions. And, and if there was, that's probably one of a, a few points I'd really want you to, to, uh, to uh, walk away with today. I love the simple composition of waste, and I'll expand on this in just a few moments. I, I love the fact there's only one rule, separate, and I'll drive home this point in just a few moments as well. I like the simple operating structure. There's a cost to collect it and then a cost to deal with it. That's it. Uh, you know, remember, I come from the restaurant business. I, I, got, I got a P&L that's 100 lines long. I got staff. I got tables. I, I got cutlery. I got food. I got liquor. I got, I got 100 things, costs I got to worry about. Waste diversion, I got to worry about collecting. I got to worry about doing something with it. I love that aspect of it. Uh, I, again, as I've come to learn, I love the role it has in reducing climate change. And I stress again, this is the easy one. And I'll expand. There's a lot I'm going to have to expand on in the next little while. I better get going. To me, it's all about diversion. Our biggest challenge, I don't disagree, is we've made it so cheap and so easy for so long that to buy anything your little heart desires with no concern what happens to it in the end, you stuff it all in a black garbage bag, you haul it to the end of the curb on Monday, and Monday night you come home and it's gone. That we made a mistake here. Hey, listen, doctors used to smoke and promote it and, and all the other stupid things. It's not the first stupid thing we've done as a civilization. Uh, it's certainly one of them. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time, over 100 years. We've had curbside collection of waste in the U.S. since the late 1800s in New York City is where it started. It, it, it's, you know, stuff it all in a bag. Unfortunately, a lot of the politicians, a lot of the decision makers uh, grew up that way. You know, it's, you, you want to mow the lawn, you see the lawnmower going, you see the smoke, you see the noise. Mom, mom, can I mow the lawn? Can I mow the lawn? No way, it's too dangerous. You can take out the trash, though. So since the age of six or eight, a lot of these politicians have been taking out the trash the same way. Whether it's a good T-shirt or a banana peel or a pop can, just stuff it in that black bag, take it out, don't worry about it. And this has to change. I think people want to do more, and as proof of that, here's some... Recent research, at least from Canada, and, I, and I, I don't believe for a moment you folks in the U.S. are any different from us. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. I think we have the same concerns uh, uh, across the border. And in this particular case, when uh, 10,000 people in Canada went surveyed, what was the number one environmental concern, environmental problem? Waste, number one. Number two, business waste, a very close second and then number three, overall consumption. Use of the car was number four. So we've got a bit of an advantage here. I think people are predisposed to this. Waste is something they produce every day from the moment they get up to the moment they go to bed. Uh, and, and I think many of them are concerned about the amount of it and want to do more uh, to, uh, to alleviate it. This is an interesting one. You know, you, tell, you hear a lot, perhaps in your business, uh, certainly in mine, EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. We should be getting producers to take responsibility. This doesn't necessarily agree with that. When that, these same people, when asked who's responsible, 4% individuals, 12% industry, but 82% said, no, no, we're all responsible. Yeah, you bought it, you made it, but I bought it, and I consumed it, and now I need to take responsibility for it as well. Just returning to this, people want to do more upfront. I think we need to be more upfront with people. Who what, it was Mark today? It's the mayor of Seattle or the governor of, uh, of Washington. We need to be, treat people like grown-ups. We need to be more upfront with what happens with the material you don't divert. That there is no little happy place for it. That it's either being burnt or buried. And, and the effects of that are devastating. We need to be more motivating. And my God, if we can get people to eat at McDonald's, we should be able to get them to do just about anything, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and I think we need to be more medieval with those 10% of the population who, who just aren't, aren't in it. Now, fortunately, I think they fall into two groups. 
I think they're older men who, again, take the, the trash this way their whole life. My father, God bless him, I miss him every day. But he, he was not good for the environment. You know, his, his attitude was just stuff it. That's what he just kept saying. Just stuff it in the bag. The other group is young men. You know, you're just out of school. You're 25 years old. You're clubbing. You got, you know, money's coming in. You're not so concerned about the environment. You're not so concerned about your waste. Give those folks five or ten years, a child, a marriage, a child or two, and I guarantee in 90% of the instances, their attitude towards their environment and the legacy they leave is going to change. So I think what we need to do is quit bitching about these two groups, put a stake in the ground, mark it, and work around them until the older group dies or until the younger group gets those kids and then we're gonna be in good shape. But we gotta stop complaining about the ones that aren't playing along, work with the ones that are, let the other ones die off. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dad. Like I said, I miss you. I think we need to be evolutionary in this as opposed to revolutionary. And I, th and I think we need, again need to be more upfront. It's gonna cost more. I mean, there is nothing cheaper than finding a hole in the ground, backing up a truck, and tipping waste into it. Nothing. Nothing. It's going to cost more. But again, in comparison to some of the other steps we're asking people to take, and my famous catchphrase, I'll expand on this in just a few moments, you'll see that there's a huge cost advantage here. So it's time now to make a few confessions. <sighs> the first one is I'm no paragon of virtue. I got a real weakness for dress shirts, a real weakness, particularly the ones that go with the initials BB. But I never pay more than 20 bucks for them. And when I finish with one, I pretty much wear it right to the end, right? I'm, I'm, I doubt you're going to have much use for this, sending it anywhere or selling it anywhere. This is a running t-shirt. Once I'm done with them, being able to wear them in public, I wear them under my running things in winter. So I wear them right to the bitter end. Uh, it's probably worthwhile now to say, if it's not clear already, to me it's all about the message. It's the, the message that we're communicating to people, and, and that message is separation. Separation, separation. And again, in, on terms of message, I don't care what you call it. Now, now my marketing background is starting to kick in. Call it marketing, advertising, PR, communications, education, spin, or bullshit. I, I don't care what term you use. It, the, the idea is the same. We're trying to stimulate, peop, motivate people to action through words and pictures. The most, the most important word in that whole idea is positioning. Where in the receptor's mind, the person you're trying to communicate, where in their mind do you want to position your message? And as I said earlier, I positioned it already with you, I, I, want a, I want waste aversion positioned as a quick, cheap, and easy means of uh, achieving sustainability. Again, just a fancy word for balance. Diversion's great. You save all these materials. In this, I'm talking about the broader spectrum of, of materials uh, as opposed to strictly textiles and leathers, uh, uh, for instance. But we save all these resources. We save the energy that, uh, of course, you conserve landfill space. You conserve all the energy that goes into harvesting these resources, uh, refining these resources, turning these rocks, wood, mineral, metals, oil into products. Uh, selling them and then disposing of them, reducing water pollution, reducing other toxins. But again, the big one, and now I'm finally going to start to make good on, I'll, I'll mention, I'll go into this later, the, the big one is the, is the climate change aspect here. Well, this is another slide I've just quickly inserted in response to a person's a question this morning about climate change. Hasn't the climate always been changing? Yes, it has. But in the past, it used to change about five degrees every 10,000 years. Now, it's changing three degrees 
in about 100 years. And, and I guess this slide's two years old. I'll bet you if I went back and drilled down as I should have and will when I'm done, when I get home, I should say, I, I, I'll bet you this number's even bigger. Climate change, global warming is happening much faster than anyone anticipated. We're seeing this principally through the loss of ice in both the uh, uh, northern and southern uh, Arctic, uh, northern Arctic and, uh, and Antarctica. It, it's happening a, a lot faster than anybody planned. I, I'm going to guess that that three degree projection is now probably closer to four or five degrees. So now what we're talking about is a change 80 to 100 times faster than has ever happened in the history of the world. And I don't think you can believe that this kind of rapid change is going on without it being something out of the ordinary that's causing it. And what's out of the ordinary that's causing it is us and the burning of fossil fuels. You know, we fired up, this began with the Industrial Revolution, 1870-something or other, right? Somebody figured out how to make mechanical power out of a fossil fuel, and man, since then, we've just been going nuts. And we go nuts with an even greater rate. We've burned more fossil fuels in the last 20 years than we've burnt since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, just in the last 20 years. And as somebody mentioned today, as China comes on board, as India comes on board, uh, some of these South African, South American uh, it's just going to keep coming on strong. So it's us, up to us who've had it so good for so long, I think at least, to start to throttle back a bit. By not diverting, con conversely, by not diverting, you're contributing to climate change, to global warming, to climate change, to, to a lack of sustainability in a number of different ways. The CO2 produced now by replacing that item, the energy that went into making that item you threw out in the first place, the, 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 the embodied energy that's in it, and then the methane that comes out of bearing organic material in landfill. And I'll go back to my old saw. I'll, I'll expand on this one too in just a few minutes. So, so we can couch the idea we're making energy through the burning of fossil fuels, we're creating CO2, warming the climate. So what is it that we use energy for? And this, what I, this is what I hope is the aha slide of the day, because I do believe it's going to surprise you. U.S. greenhouse gas sources, 18% are used for personal transportation, 18%. 22% are used to heat, light, and cool homes and apartments. But 50% of the energy we produce, I mean, we don't produce energy just for the fun of it, right? We don't burn these fossil fuels just to fire it off down the line to nowhere. We're using this energy. What it, we use 50% of it just to make stuff, to cut down a tree, dig up metal, pump up oil, send it to a factory, embody energy, further amounts of energy into it as we fashion it into the goods we purchase each day, transport it around, consume it, and then throw it out. More than the use of our cars and heating, lighting, and cooling our homes combined is the amount of energy we use just to make stuff. So there really only own th are only three steps. I, again, my argument with Mark, as it were, I, I, I think there's much that can be done by individuals. Let me rephrase that. I think of what, much of what has to be done is done by individuals, but there really isn't a whole lot we can ask people to do. There isn't a whole lot we need to ask them to do. Yeah, you need to get out of your car. You need to walk when you can, bike when you can. Use transit when you can, but face it. I mean, we've built these cities on the basis of the car. They're very uh, uh, sparsely populated. Public transit is not efficient. 
For my money, we should anybody who comes through the door with a, a way to power a car using anything other than gas, we should just be throwing money at them, no matter how ridiculous the idea sounds. We've got to find another way to power the automobile, one that doesn't spew carbon. But again, only 18% of energy use. Yeah, you need to insulate your home. I was joking with someone before, you know, I, I, think we sh I don't think we should be sending troops overseas to be protecting our oil interests. I think we should be having them go door to door, one guy with a clipboard, the other guy with a gun, and informs you, today you're getting an energy audit. <laughs> We're going to go through your home. Apparently, the average home in Toronto, at least, you know, housing stock as much as 100 years old, the average, but again, not a lot different from many of the northern cities. I know a city like Atlanta's a lot more a recent in terms of the housing, much of the housing stock. But I understand the average home in Toronto, with all the cracks and the leaks and all the rest of it, has a hole in it three feet in diameter. So imagine basically taking off your front door or one of your good-sized windows and just leaving it off, summer and winter. Those are the cracks, the holes, the crevices that are, that are in your home that need to be worked out. We need to get the LED lighting, all of those things. And again, going door to door with a clipboard, guy with a clipboard, guy with a gun doesn't sound like such a bad idea to me. But it's diverting your waste. To me, is the, the one we're, we're overlooking far too much. And I come back to it again, the one that's the quickest, cheapest, and easiest <laughs> to get us to where we need to go. Because think about it, $30,000 for a hybrid car. Now, how long is it going to take us to put a hybrid in every driveway in America, particularly at 30 grand a pop? A high efficiency furnace, I've got 3,000 down here. I think it's probably about twice that. So again, how long do you think it's going to take to get everybody into a high efficiency furnace, high efficiency air conditioning? We're talking decades. But the two containers, for example, to introduce a food scrap collection program into a municipality costs about $30 and in theory could, hypothetically at least, could be brought in overnight. Now, I know that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I don't think two years. If a city decided tomorrow, hey, we want a food scrap collection program, and got on the ball, it's not inconceivable that within two years, every single one of those homes in that city would be taking a major step towards the mitigation of climate change for $30 for two containers. So I come back to this at yet another time. When it comes to achieving sustainability, waste aversion, waste aversion quicker. We can bring these programs on a hell of a lot faster than we're ever going to get people into a hybrid or get them having a high-efficiency furnace. Cheaper, we've already talked about the cost, $30,000, $3,000, 30 bucks for a couple of food scrap containers. And yes, easier. Getting people out of their cars, good luck. Energy efficiency home, we just, energy efficiency at home, the key is we just need to make the price of power more reflective of what it costs the environment. So when you leave the porch light on overnight for no good reason, rather than cost you 20 cents, it costs you a couple of bucks. And so maybe you think twice about it. So let's talk specifically now about diverting waste. And what I want to talk specifically, and what I mentioned earlier, is one of the reasons I love waste so much is in reality how simple its composition is. And now I, I'm going back to RAFG. And again, if you're interested in the subject, great book, Rubbish. This is the guy who, who taught me, uh, Carville, who was the guy uh, 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 Clinton's campaign. It's all about the economy, stupid. With waste, it's all about the composition, stupid. Doesn't mean, mean to say. The reality of it is waste is fairly simple in its composition. Between 40 and 45% of what comes out of any North American home is recyclable material. Paper, uh, packaging, and, and, and uh, various containers of glass, metal, and plastic. 
40 to 45 percent of it is just recyclables. Another 40 to 45 percent of it is organic material. And I'm thinking specifically about leaf and yard material and food scraps. Uh, but uh, wood would also be included, and so too, of course, would textiles, or non-synthetic non textile. Uh, uh, the, what remains, what I lovingly call the last six, electronics, uh, uh, electronics, uh, uh, textiles and carpets. Um, I, my mind's gone blank for uh, a second. Uh, Unfortunately, the list comes up in a little bit later. But the, what I lovingly call the last six, true residual waste is about 10%. The, that, that amount of the waste stream that, that I believe will, will in fact be somewhat problematic, uh, 10 to 15, probably less by weight, uh, a little bit more by volume. S some of the problematic material tends to be lighter uh, and, uh, and take up more landfill space. There's an old saying that landfills don't get heavy, they get fat. Nobody closes a landfill because it exceeds some weight limit. What it exceeds is a volume limit. And a lot of this material, this problematic material, does not tend to crush very well. Take an ordinary chip bag, crush it in your hand. And there's a fair amount of pressure, per pounds per square inch pressure in your hand, and then unleash it. And by and large, it bounces right back. And by and large, that's what happens in a landfill. They try and run over that thing with a bow mag you know, all day long. But in a lot of cases, that material just bounces back. So uh, true residual waste, 10% uh, or less, uh, and, and represents perhaps the, the true uh, problematic material. So again, getting back to this idea of positioning, if this is the way waste is composed, then the positioning falls out that we only need folks to take three steps. You need to get the rate of recycling up. 50% now, there's no reason in the world it shouldn't be 100. And I love these people, you know, I can never remember what bin things go in. You know, if you produced waste once a week or once a month, I'd buy that argument. But the reality of it is you woke up this morning and you started making, it's sad to say, you started making waste. And you made it all day long. And if you can after a couple of weeks, and the other point is we're creatures of habit. We tend to consume the same things. If you're a Coke drinker, if you're a banana eater, what have you. We're, our consumption is, by and large, out of habit. So the, the point here is, if you can't remember in a week or two that this goes into a blue bin, this goes into a green bin, and this goes to a Planet Aid uh, uh, clothing collection box, you're just not trying, right? It's time to go back to, time to, go back to school. This is the easy one. Yep. So again, this is, goes whether you're in a home or apartment, school, what have you. Only one rule, keep the stuff separate. And in this, uh, who went into the store any time recently and bought this? Anybody? No, right? You bought it all. Nobody goes in and buys the can of beans, banana, cell phone special at Walmart. You bought a can of beans separately, you bought a cell phone separately, you bought a banana separately, you bought a Brooks Brothers shirt separately. You consumed it separately, and at one point in time, you held each separately in your hand. And at the end of the day, all we're asking people to do is just keep stuff separate. That's it. That's the only message we need to be driving home to people's mind. Mix it all together, it's aptly named. It's garbage. There's nothing we're going to do with it. Keep it separate, we can perform miracles on this material. So in other words, to solve this problem, all you need is two things, your brains and your wrists. I do think people believe the benefits of diversion. After all, look how far we've got with this milk and toast uh, idea that's good for the environment, whatever the hell that means. We've come a long way. People believe the benefits. What they think is diversion's a hassle. And again, I, I encourage you to drive home this fact that, you know, it was separate to start with. You bought it separately. You consumed it separately. Just keep it separate. It's all we're asking you to do. Recycling, great first step. Recycle one pop can. You save three hours worth of energy. Three hours worth of energy goes into a pop can. So your kid goes to school that goes to school, drinks a can of pop, 
can, recycles it, comes home, plays three hours of video game, by and large, for this particular example, they're carbon neutral. Throw it into the trash, and now they've generated six hours worth of energy CO2, as it were. Taking this a step further, a ton of recyclables mitigates four tons of GHG. If you remove the glass, it's three. Gra glass is not a particularly energy intensive material to make. And this is a slide that I want you to keep in mind uh, as I'll come back to it. So my message, America, take that extra step, got to recycle. The beauty of it, practice in separation, get people in the habit. So what's next? Organics, the compostable organics out of landfill are the logical next step. Wood, paper, leaf, yard, food scraps, leathers and textiles. This is where you start to come back into the picture specifically. Over 66%, two thirds of what we bury in a landfill is compostable material. Buried in a landfill, it generates methane. A greenhouse gas, 100 times more potent than CO2. Mark talked specifically today strictly about CO2. It's, it's the methane. We got about 20 years, some will say we got about 20 years left to turn this ship around. It's the methane that's 100 times more potent than volume that we really need to be uh, mitigating. The biggest man-made source of methane on Earth, landfills from the compostable material that we bury in them, including, of course, cotton, leathers, and other, I'll try this word again, non-synthetic, I don't have trouble with that, non-synthetic textiles. <laughs> the benefits, again, conserve landfill space, mitigate methane. So remember we talked about the recyclables. A ton of recyclables mitigates four tons of GHGs. A ton of food scraps between five and six tons of CO2, right? It also produce the soil, pesticide use, fertilizer use. And I don't have to go into this to any great detail. Will did a great job this morning informing you of, of, the, of what we're doing to the soil and the importance of rebuilding the soil, particularly, again, as it represents the base material for more than half or more of the items you deal in. Specifically, what I'm talking about is the growth, growing of cotton. The application of compost, many benefits, returns organic material, meaning less pesticides and fertilizers need to be used themselves, very energy intensive to make. Look at a list, for fun, look at a list of what they call large final emitters. Those companies, those services generating excessive amounts of CO2, many of them make pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides. These items are very energy intensive to make, very energy intensive. If you recycle that banana peel, we wouldn't have to. It improves the water holding capacity and uh, uh, reduces soil erosion. So my specific message here, Atlanta, take that next step. Separate out those compostables. Contain, you already give us your containers and fibers. Hey, it's banana peel time. So last six. Here's my list, electronics, furniture, mattresses. Again, here's where you're in the picture. Textiles, including carpets. Renovation material, hazardous waste, and miscellaneous. About 10 or 12% of the waste stream. Let's talk, some of this information that is not new to many of you. It was to me as I went through this. Again, each home produces about 70 pounds. We divert only about 15% of this material. 85% of clothing is going to landfill or incineration in this country. It's a travesty. By discard, and in doing so, we're increasing water use, we're increasing material use, chemical use, energy use, pollution, methane from disposal. I mean, this, we couldn't be wanting to do more damage if we set out to do so specifically. Specifically, growing cotton. And again, this information probably isn't new to a lot of you. 50% of the world's text, 48%, I should say, the world's textile trade is in cotton. It uses 20, here in the US, 25% of pesticide and fertilizer use is used just to grow cotton. Water use, this is the one that floored me. One six ounce t shirt between 2,500 and 4,500 liters of water to grow that T-shirt. Between 25 and 4,500 liters of water. 
That's water that's got to be pumped around. We have to have energy to pump it around. It, it, it just, this is craziness. Remember what I said earlier. Here's the, here's the money slide coming up for you guys. One ton of mixed recyclables, three tons of GHGs, four if you remove the glass. One ton of food scraps, one to, five to six tons of GHGs. One reuse, this is US, uh, or I should say UK study. One, use one, reuse one ton of t-shirts, you're gonna mitigate 13 tons of CO2. And again, this is the easy one. And the quick one, and the cheap one. Just jumping off, slightly off track, green jobs, you know, jobs in specific, green jobs in particular, everybody's talking about what in God's name could be greener than diverting clothing, I ask you. And the fact is that if you landfill or incinerate uh, on a per ton basis, per pound basis, whatever measure you want to use, you're generating one job. By diverting that same weight of material, you're generating 10 jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, paying jobs, badly needed jobs, jobs. I have two modest proposals as I begin to wrap up that I'd, I'd like to make. One might be a suggestion, anywhere you buy clothes, you can return them. Another one would be a ban on disposal, prep, bad wording on my part, a phase out on the disposal of textiles either to landfill or an incineration a phase out over a three, a five, a 10 year period. Bans seem a little harsh, they seem a little radical, they seem like you're a crazy environmentalist. I didn't mean to use the term, I apologize. A phase out of the disposal of textiles to landfill or incineration. On another note, and I'm probably not the first one to stand here and tell you this, I'm certainly gonna be moving forward with some specific design for the environment, policies and ideas. Uh, make it easier to repair and replace various aspects. I can't believe my beautiful Brooks Brothers shirt that I'm going to love to death when it loses a button and I donate it, it will, will not get used here in, North, in America simply for the want of a one lousy button. There, there's just something wrong with that. How am I doing? I've got time for that little extra part or should I finish up? Five minutes. I'll finish. So again, in terms of position, I want to drive home this point. If I haven't already, simple, responsible waste diversion can play a significant role in reducing climate change. And this is the quick, the cheap, and the easy one. As compared to the money we're pouring into public transit, the money we're pouring into energy efficiency programs, if we poured a fraction of that money into diversion programs, uh, be it they have, of recyclables, of, of, of food scraps, and of course of textiles, we'd go a, a, get a much, much bigger bang for our buck. Again, with just three steps we need to take, ask people to take, gotta get recycling up, organics in, and the last six out of a waste stream. I hope in the time I've had today, I've given you three things, and I want you to take this message and give people those same three things. Direction, focus, and hope. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? And for God's sakes, how's it gonna help? I wanna start as I began with a quote. This one you may be familiar with, the folk song from Pete Seeger. Step by step, the longest march can be won. I want to thank you so very, very much for your time and attention again for inviting me down here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much.